All right, today we're going to be talking about different types of sampling, and we're going to go over what a good sample looks like versus what a bad sample looks like. You learned a little bit over the summer, but we're going to take it a step further. So you're going to be learning some real straight definitions, and I'll provide examples when possible. So you'll get an idea of, you know, when we come out of this, how you perform a good sample, and what type of sample is it? Because you're going to be learning about a lot of different types today. So just a review, right? A sample is a small, actually I'm even going to take out small. Reason is sometimes samples can be pretty big. Like you're trying to sample like 250 million people and you do a sample of a million people. It's a subgroup of your population, but it's still pretty big. So we're going to say a subgroup of your population. Now remember, if you're looking at a population that's small, then you don't necessarily even want to do a sample. Like if you want to figure out like the favorite pizza topping of everybody in class, you don't need to do a sample. You do a census. You just ask everybody. That's nice and easy. Remember, if you're looking at a population that's really difficult to get information from every single person or individual, then that's when you're going to go with a sample. So it's a subgroup of your population. And we also want them to be random. We want them to be random. That's really important. So we're going to talk about different types of samples, you know, because some samples are better than others and some apply to different situations. Chances are you've read about a few of them, but we're going to put them out there right now. So the first type we're going to talk about is called a simple random sample. Typically in this class, we're going to call it an SRS. So a simple random sample. It's not as simple as it seems, but that's what we call it. It is a sample when every individual, and here's the key part here. A lot of people forget this, but it's a very important part of a simple random sample. So when every individual and every possible group has the same chance of being selected. That looks awful, but I can adjust that. So what does that mean, right? So say you want to do a simple random sample of Grafton High School students. A simple random sample, say you wanted to do like, um, you wanted to get 30 Grafton High School students. If it's genuinely a simple random sample, that means every single Grafton High School student has the same chance of being selected for your sample, and also every possible group of 30 students has the same probability of being selected. Now ideally, if you're doing it randomly, you want to get something that looks like a small picture of your population, right? So if you think about Grafton High School, you figure you got four different grades, right? So you probably want all the grades distributed pretty evenly. Now, what happens with a simple random sample Ideally, it's going to look like, you know, maybe you'll get like, you know, a chunk of uh, sophomores, chunk of freshmen, chunk of juniors, chunk of seniors, you know, and evenly distributed amongst males and females too. That's what you're hoping happens with a simple random sample. Because of the fact that it's so random, it happens a lot. But sometimes it doesn't. Because you still have the same probability of selecting 30 male juniors as you do 30 individuals who are all spread out amongst grades and all you know different genders too so that's kind of something you risk with a simple random sample it doesn't happen a lot so i mean we like simple random samples because there's so many possibilities that the one you're getting chances are it's going to look like your population it's going to represent it and that's what you're hoping here so how do we do simple random samples well there are a couple of different ways you can do it don't mind me i'm just shrinking some stuff i always do that with my notes here more often than not, maybe you've read it a little bit, maybe, heck, maybe we've even gotten to an activity. If we haven't, no big deal. We like random number generators. And I'm just going to abbreviate numbers. You have one in your calculator, and you're going to watch a short video that shows you how to use it. But, like, say you want to do it here for Grafton High School. You give each individual student a number, like one, two, maybe you go in alphabetical order, and then you give them, you know, one, two, three, all the way up to like 900, however many students are here. 
and then you select 30 numbers between 1 and 900. Those 30 numbers you select correspond with those students, and you get a nice random group of individuals. Random number generator is a great way of doing that. Of course, you want to remember, first of all, you have to assign every individual a number before you select it. You can't just select numbers and say, oh, okay, I'll just stick them to whomever. No, you have to assign those numbers to your individuals. So random number generators are great. Another way of doing it, the old-fashioned way, pick from a hat. What do I mean by that? I had a student who loved doing this a few years ago. They would say, well, if I did this, you know, if I were to do a simple random sample of this population, I would take each individual's name, write it on a small piece of paper, and fold it up. I would make sure those small pieces of paper were all the same size. I would then put all the pieces of paper in the hat. I would shake the hat, and now it's like 30 names from that hat. So picking from a hat, you know, I'm going to put that in quotation marks, but you get the idea. Like, you know, you just kind of mix it up, and then you randomly select it. It's kind of, it's, you're kind of doing a random number generator there. You're randomly selecting something. So you can do pick from a hat. Now bear in mind, if you're going to, on a test that asks you to explain a simple random sample, if you're going to do pick from a hat, make sure you're specific. Say like I write every individual's name on a piece of paper that's the same size. I fold them up, mix them up, and then I randomly select them. Another way you can do it is the random table of digits. I am not going to lie to you, this is a little outdated considering we have calculators at this point. We have you know, so many different ways of doing a random, simple random sample. Random table of digits isn't, you know, it's there. I'm going to show you how to do it at some point. But I'd say with technology these days, you're not going to be using it too much. So simple random sample, when every individual and in every possible group has the same chance of being selected. We like these when possible. However, you're going to find that sometimes, you know, it might not be the best way to go. Especially like say, you know, we're doing graft in high school, right? You're not necessarily guaranteed to get a group that's going to be representative of your population here. Because you could, in theory, get a group that has a lot of seniors in it and no freshmen. Now, seniors might be thinking, hey, it doesn't matter what a freshman thinks. But we do want it to look like our population. So we want to have some freshmen in there. We want to have sophomores, juniors, and seniors. How can we do a sample that selects from every group? That's where we're going next with this. And that's what's called a stratified random sample. So before we jump into that, we're going to talk about what strata means. Maybe you've heard it, maybe you haven't. I'll put down here, strata is just a group. It's a group you assign. So for a stratified random sample, you separate, I don't know if I spelled that right, I always, I'm not for sure if that's an E or an A, but we'll find out. You separate your whole population into groups. Now ideally, these are groups where they share some sort of common characteristic. Now what you'll find sometimes is like, if it has to do with people, sometimes they'll do it like in alphabetical order, like everyone's last name begins with A is one group, everyone's last name begins with B is another group, and so on and so on. That's one way of doing it. But you want to make sure the groups share some sort of similar characteristic. Or maybe like for graphs in high school, maybe you separate it by gender, maybe separate it by hair color. Could be a lot of different ways you do it, but you come up with some sort of similar characteristic and you separate that population into those groups. Then, here's the important part. Randomly select a number of individuals from each group. Let's shove strata down here. So what might that look like? Say you're doing a sample of graphing high school students, right? We come up with four groups. What's an easy way to do it? Ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. You got four groups that you've established for your whole population. And then you'll say, okay, I'll randomly select 10 freshmen, 10 sophomores, 
10 juniors, and then 10 seniors. You're randomly selecting from each group. So essentially, you're doing a simple random sample in each of these groups that you create. That's what a stratified sample is, a stratified random sample. What you're doing is you're creating groups, and then you're randomly selecting from these groups. And hopefully by doing that, your goal is that you want to get something that resembles your population. That is always your goal when you're doing a good sample. So you might find that doing a stratified sample could help you out in that case. That might be a good way of doing it. Some people like that. That could work if you wanted to get a you know, good sample of Grafton High School students. Sometimes stratified samples aren't as easy. Sometimes they aren't as representative of your population. But you can do another sample that involves groups, and that's what's called a cluster sample. What is a cluster sample? A cluster sample is when you separate your population into groups. Sounds familiar, right? A lot of times with a cluster sample, excuse me, you try to do it by proximity. So like if you're doing it like, here's a great example. Say you go down to the cafeteria, right? You go down to all three lunches and you decide, I want to do a random sample of all Grafton High School students. So you go down to the cafeteria. You have everybody sitting at tables, right? Every cafeteria table could be a cluster. Now, of course, I guess I'm going back to last year when we all could sit at a table and now we're at desks. But you know what I mean. Like if you go down to a table that had like 10 kids in it, each table could be a cluster, right? And then you randomly select a group or groups, depending. Maybe you want more than one group. That's fine. You can do that. And sample every individual in that group. So I guess one way you could also think about it, say you want to do a cluster sample, right? Maybe someone says, oh, I'll cluster them by grade. I'll do a cluster of 9th graders, 10th graders, 11th graders, and 12th graders, and I'm going to randomly select one of those groups. So then you do that, and then you randomly select sophomores. All right, I'm going to ask every single sophomore, and that's my sample. As you can see, not perfect, because that does not represent your population, because all you have are sophomores there. However, as I said, if you did it by like, you know, going down to the cafeteria and you randomly selected like five tables and asked everyone at that table, you could get a generous mix of all four grades. That could be cool. That could be a great way of doing a cluster sample. Or maybe you cluster them by, you know, um, last, you know, their last name, the uh, first letter of it. So you say like, you know, do clusters of everyone's last name begins with A, everyone's last name begins with B, everyone's last name begins with C and so on. And then you randomly select four letters. All right, I've selected B, N, Q, W. Then you, then you ask everyone in those groups, everyone whose last name begins with B, everyone whose last name begins with Q, everyone whose last name begins with W. And I forgot the fourth letter, but you can ask everyone in that group. That's a cluster sample. You randomly select groups and ask everyone in those groups. So as you can see, there are advantages and disadvantages to going with those. It all depends on what kind of sample you're doing here. So those are the three big samples. Those are the three good samples. There are going to be some samples that you don't want to do. There are some bad samples. We're going to talk about a couple bad samples. A bad sample. Here's a bad sample. And, oh, it happens too much. It's what's called a convenient sample. And it sounds just like it is. It's from, you know, you ask the individuals that are easiest. Here's, here's one example of a convenient sample. Again, we'll stick with the whole Grafton High School thing. You say, all right, I guess I'll do a convenient sample. So you get to school and you're like, man, I got work to do. I don't have time for this. All right, I'm just going to ask the first 20 people to walk in through that door, you know, the entrance. Boom, you ask them and you're like, sample's done. Boom. That's my convenient sample. Problem with doing a convenient sample is that it doesn't represent your population. Why? Because the rest of the population 
has no chance of being selected. We don't want that. We want it so everyone has the same chance of being selected. So say you decide, okay, I'm going to take the first 20 people who go through the front door. Okay, what about the people who go in the side door? What about the people who come to school a bit later? Say the people who came a bit earlier than you. They had no chance of being involved in this. That's bad. That's what a convenience sample is. When you just ask people when it's easy, you know, or get individuals that's easy. Like here's an example too. Say Apple decides, okay, we got a bunch of iPhones that are ready to go. We got the new iPhone, oh, what model are we on, like 13? All right, cool, we got a bunch of iPhone 13s ready to go out. Oh no, I think there might be something wrong with the iPhone 13. We got a million of them all ready to go. So how are you gonna test all these iPhones? All right, a cluster sample might be, all right, we got them grouped in the boxes of 100. I'll randomly select four boxes and then out of those boxes, I'll go through every iPhone and make sure they're okay. And then you find that they're all okay and you say, okay, I randomly selected these boxes. I went through every single one, did a nice cluster sample. iPhone looks ready to go, cool. Maybe do a stratified sample saying, okay, I'm gonna go to each box of iPhones, each box of 100. I'm randomly gonna select one iPhone from each box and I'm gonna check it. Again, you get a nice represent, representation of your population. You go into every box. It's kind of cool, you know, you got something random. Now, one be a simple random sample is, all right, you got a million iPhones, I'm gonna go, do numbers one through a million, and I'm gonna randomly select 20 numbers, and whichever iPhones those correspond to, I'm gonna check those iPhones. A lot more time consuming, but again, it's random, we'd like that. You have a better chance of checking stuff out here. If you did a convenient sample, now I'd be like, all right, I'm gonna go with a box in front of me, I'm gonna check the top 10 iPhones that are right on top. As you can see, you can see what, why it might be a bad thing. Maybe those top 10 iPhones, maybe there's something wrong with all of them. And then you're like, oh my gosh, stop the shipment. Gotta stop sending these iPhones out. When in reality, it's only those 10 phones and like the other 999,990, yeah, 990 are fine. So you're wasting a lot of money and time. Or maybe you look at the first 10 iPhones and say, oh, they're okay, let's send them out. And then guess what? Maybe another 800,000 iPhones are messed up and then Apple's like, oh man, we got that on our face. Convenience samples when you're going with something that's close and you're like, all right, I'm gonna just go with that. You do not want convenience samples. Those are bad. That's an example of a bad sample. Now in my next video, I'm gonna go over bias, which you've probably heard that term before, but it comes up in sampling and it can be really bad. It can help, uh, it can lead to some bad numbers, can lead to some bad conclusions. That's what we're gonna go over in our next video.